special guest is Ed Cranepool. David Johnson, the manager of the New York Mets. I'm talking with Johnny Bench, and Johnny Bench, one of the great catchers of all time. Welcome to Kiner's Corner Revisited on SNY.TV. I'm Ted Berg, and joined by Ralph Kiner, the longtime Mets broadcaster and Hall of Famer. Ralph, thanks for being here. All right, good to be here and good to talk about baseball, old time baseball. Well, let's look at some old time, not, not that old time, but some older baseball, an interview you did in the mid 80s with Johnny Bench. Well, Johnny Bench is a good friend of mine and one of the greatest talents that ever played the game of baseball. You know, no National League catcher, but uh, two guys ever led the National League in batting average. And it wasn't Johnny Bench. One was Ernie Lombardi, who was a slowest man that ever played the game of baseball running wise. I mean, he was unbelievably slow. I mean, if we were in a race with a pregnant girl, he'd finish second. <laughs> yeah. And, and the, whole, but the whole thing, but he, he was one. And the other was a guy named Bubbles Hargrave. Now, anybody that could live in baseball in the major leagues with the nickname of Bubbles has got to be in the Hall of Fame, but he isn't. He, had, he never made it. He probably had to be pretty tough going through life. He had life, to be tough. That. That's right. And he loved the thing. Now, in the American League, only one guy's ever, as a catcher, has ever made one the batting table, and that's the guy with the Minnesota Twins. Now, Yeah, Joe Meyer. Let's look at Johnny Bench. You know, as a catcher, you were given credit for being the first one-handed catcher. I don't know if that's exactly true, <laughs> but you did catch with one hand, and that certainly had to save your meat hand, your bare hand, from broken bones. Well, uh, you can see, Ralph, there's no big knuckles there or anything else. I never broke this, uh, any fingers. I broke the thumb uh, in the minor leagues, and I split it, uh, in fact, in 67. That's the only reason I got to be Rookie of the Year next year, because I needed four at-bats, and I split the thumb. And then in about with about two or three games to go, and Br Bristol said, uh, "Honors don't mean anything to me. You're going to play." So <laughs> I was out there playing, and that's when I split it. And uh, I think Randy Hundley, and there, you know, I think um, Elston Howard and a few people used it. They say they gave me credit for just redefining it a little bit uh, with my sweep tags and uh, that type of playing. I used it as a first base glove in a sense, and kept my hand away from it. I figured if Randy Hundley could catch the way he did, and and stay in that many games. That was the only way I was going to make money. It was the only way I was going to be able to produce, uh, get big numbers on the board. And uh, it turned out to be uh, th exactly that, exactly what I wanted to do. And uh, it was able to extend my career. Was Bench the best catcher you ever saw? I would say yes. I, uh, I didn't see, of course, Mink Cochran, Joe, uh, Bill Dickey, and people like that back in, in the 30s. But uh, he, was, uh, he, he was also a great hitter. And uh, he was uh, did that. Now he finished his career as a third baseman, so he moved out of the catching position. He was talking about Randy Huntley. Huntley caught something like 150 games one year, which was at that time was a 154 game season, and uh, he played almost all all the games that year. How he did that? That's amazing. And of course, Randy's son Todd played for the Mets. Todd, and he is, was one of our good players. Who is the best Met Mets catcher you ever saw? Well, I think, boy, you have to, with, really have to go out of the defensive part of the game and talk about the offensive, and it'd be, toward, it'd be Piazza. There's a renewed uh, emphasis on defense in baseball lately, and, and catching defense is something that's so hard to quantify and really so hard to judge. What do you think is the most important part of a catcher's game? Is it throwing out base runners, which is something Piazza struggled with, or is it you know, blocking the balls and calling the game and those things we might not notice as much? I think probably the most important is really calling the game. But uh, you have to put the, all the elements together. And uh, the one thing about uh, uh, Piazza was he hit so well. He also was very good on pop flies, foul flies, and things like that, but didn't throw that well. And uh, eventually, when he couldn't hit the ball, now we have to get in steroids, but that, we won't talk about that. When he couldn't hit the ball, he had to get out of the game. There's something to be said for just being willing to catch, right? I mean, a hitter of Piazza's caliber normally is moved to first base, moved to the outfield. You know, no, they did move him to first base. Well, eventually. But, and he was know, lousy at first base. I, I remember as well as anyone, I was there. I mean, I was, it was brutal as a Mets fan. It I really was, yeah. That, because it was just so depressing to see such a great player struggling so dearly. But I think Piazza should get credit for having played such a 
a large part of his career behind the plate uh, at a hitting at a level where you'd probably want to save his knees, save his legs a little bit. You know, when he signed up, it was uh, Tommy Lasorda that got him to sign with the Dodgers because <laughs> nobody wanted him. And they said, he can't play a position. And uh, they, so they made him a catcher. He wasn't a total <laughs> loss as a catcher. He was a good catcher in a way. He just had a few, he wasn't a great catcher, but he's good. But uh, he was a great guy to have in the team and he made himself into an outstanding ball player. How do you know if a catcher is calling a good game? Is it just results or are there tendencies? I think <laughs> you asked a tough question. Uh, really the results. And uh, the uh, amount of uh, balls hit hard. I mean, the, and if you really watch the game, if the pitcher is hitting the targets and he's making the targets available that are the right ones, and it's that way you could tell it to some extent. When you were playing, did you were you aware of a catcher's tendencies, of a catcher's habits in game calling? Oh, yes. And uh, catchers tip off pitches and that sort of thing. And as a hitter, you want to know what's going on and you watch the catcher. And of course, one of the things that hitters do and they don't, they take a real chance is that they peek at the catcher's signs and they get the pitches that way. But if they find out about that, then you have then you got a problem. I noticed Ruben Tejada actually doing that in a recent Mets game. What is the I mean, what is the repercussion if a, if a player does that? Well, you can't say this in the present day ruling is knockdown pitches, and they uh, give you a sign and you think it's going to be a fastball or a curve, and it's not that pitch, and it's a knockdown pitch, and you could get seriously hurt. Ralph, thanks so much. Check us out next time on Kiner's Corner Revisited on SNY.TV.